Well, welcome to RD Works Learning Lab. You might get the impression that we're going to do some archery today. Uh, sorry to disappoint you. The first thing we're going to do is disappear off this screen and go and have a look at something interesting that's arrived in the post. Well, here it is at last, a power meter that will actually tell me how many watts my machine is developing. Now, this is a calibrated piece of kit, which has been manufactured in America by a company called Macken Instruments. First of all, I can't buy one of these in the UK over the internet or from America, it would appear. Um, but I have a collaborator who watches my videos. His name is 2020 Tesla, and he was good enough to purchase this on my behalf. And he's already tested his 60 watt machine with this piece of kit. He was surprised to find that his 60 watt machine was probably somewhere in the region of about 48 or 49 watts. Now at about 200 pounds this is not the sort of thing that many people will bother to go out and buy just because they're curious about what their machine can and will do. But I'm afraid I'm an engineer and I like to know everything about my machine. Now basically what we've got here is a thermometer but it's a relative thermometer rather than an absolute thermometer. With this large thumb wheel at the back here I can adjust the reading so that it is zero. We've obviously got a thermometer sitting down inside this block. Now what we've got on the bottom here is a block of aluminium which has been uh, first of all shot blasted and secondly it has been anodized, quite heavily anodized, um, because anodize in itself is an excellent absorber of infrared radiation. Aluminium is a very very good um, transmitter of heat and so consequently this block when you expose it to the radiation heats up and this is just a straightforward what I would class as a lollipop calorimeter. There's a certain mass of material here and when you heat that mass up with a certain amount of energy the temperature rise is directly proportional to the energy that you put in. Once the system is calibrated the, the measured output here is a measure of the wattage or the power that's going into this block. Now it is an average power because it takes 20 seconds. In fact, if we look on the side here, it takes 20.2 seconds is the calibrated value for this piece of equipment, this specific piece of equipment. It's been tested against some standard somewhere and we have a calibration certificate that tells me that it's plus or minus 5% accurate um, provided I expose it to radiation for 20.2 seconds. The problem I've got with this calibration certificate is it doesn't tell me very much. It tells me that it's used against a certain standard here which I can't track down. But for example, let's look at the physics of this for a minute. Heat is a wonderful thing. Um, it's best imagined as water. If we imagine this as a bath with a tap, which is the radiation, running into the bath, around the outside here, which is the surface we're not applying radiation to, we've got all these surfaces here which are basically like the plug hole. Depending on what the temperature of the outside air is relative to this block, the water or the heat will flow out of this block at the same time as it's flowing into the block. The higher the temperature of this block, the faster the water, the heat, will radiate away from these other surfaces. I would have expected to find on this calibration chart some sort of specification which said that this was tested at 20 or 21 degrees C and that this calibration was valid at 21 degrees C. Now out in my workshop at the moment the temperature is probably round about 10 and sometimes it drops to even maybe 5 or 4 degrees C. Now that's quite a lot of temperature difference for heat to flow away from here. Now I know it's only 20 seconds that we're exposing this to it, but you know that could be quite a lot of radiated heat that disappears from these surfaces and stops this from recording it. My engineering education was one of always be cynical, always ask questions, always look carefully, and that's what I've done in this particular case. Now what I've done here is I've just made myself a little foam jacket to fit round what I would class as the bath plug. So we're going to fill this up with water from the tap and we're trying to put a plug in the hole 
so that none of it runs away and in fact what we're doing is we are recording the true temperature rise in this block as best as we can because we've still got some radiation away from this front surface here. I have been out to the machine and just carried out one or two tests and to be honest today is quite a warm day relatively speaking it's probably about 13 or 14 degrees C so it's not a huge temperature difference away from probably where it's calibrated at 20 or 21 degrees C but I'm going to reserve judgment on that for the really cold days I might be picking up as much as half a watt difference between jacket on or jacket off I'm very happy to use this without its jacket on now that I've tested it for myself now to test the power into our power meter we need to fire energy at it but we're not allowed to fire energy at one spot. Now you've seen that the calibration chart tells us that we've got to expose the lollipop for exactly 20.2 seconds. And what we've got here is a path length. When we run round it at nine millimeters per second should give us 20.2 seconds. Now if we go up to preview, we can check whether or not the path length is correct. And if we go up to the light time up the top here, you can see that it says 31.7. Well, that's nothing like the correct time. Now, why would that be? Let's just go back and have a check. Now, you'll notice that I've got two colours on this drawing. I've got a black section and a blue section. Now, let's go and have a look at the blue section for a start. The blue section, we've said that it's an output and we're going to run it at one millimeter per second. It's about 11 millimeters long, so it's going to take approximately 11 seconds to traverse across from the center of that target to the outside of that target. And we're going to make it cut at 1% power. Well, in reality, 1% power won't turn the laser on, so it won't do anything. Basically, it's a non-cutting traverse that I've put in there, idle time which buys me time to do something after I press the start button. OK, now what we're going to do temporarily is we're going to turn this. It says is output. Do we want the output to be recognized? No. And we'll say OK. Now we go back to our preview and we'll take a look here at the light time. And you'll see that now the light time is 20.2 seconds plus five thousandths of a second, which I think we're going to ignore. But basically, we've now got the right path length. And I achieved that path length by gently trimming this little piece here. So now we'll put the path back in because we need that to work. So we need to just save that to a file now and we'll jump out to the machine. Okay, now I'm just starting up with a cold machine and uh, this is about the third or fourth time that I've run my spiral test. The first couple of times it only jumped up to about 16 milliamps. So it appears that the machine needs to go through some sort of warm-up cycle initially. As you can see there, 65% power. It's running rock steady at 20 milliamps. Now I've taken the nozzle off for the moment because I'm going to be using my power meter to very quickly run through the machine. I'm not going to do a full spectrum test, I'm just going to do a quick exploratory test on various parts of the machine. The full spectrum test will be something that I should do separately. It's a very tedious exercise um, which you certainly won't want to be involved with, you'll only want to be seeing the results. But let's have a quick exploratory today. Right, so here we are at the, uh, the output from the laser and the first thing that I'm going to do is just set this to zero. OK, well we can start things going. I'm in no hurry because we've got 10 or 11 seconds in which to get the meter into this sort of position here. And there we are, we've got a nice peak beam running. And a quick check on the ammeter over the top there tells me we're running at 20 milliamps. And it's gone up to 36. It's 
37 and that's it 37 watts coming out of that tube it's a little bit disappointing considering it's supposed to be a 50 watt tube now off camera I'm just dipping the uh, the lollipop in my water tank just to cool it down quickly and there we are about 10 seconds about 10 seconds in the water tank and it's cooled it right back to zero again first thing we're going to do is to set this to zero and then we'll pop this on my little fixture here now that's something that I didn't mention when I generated my program the last thing that I did and I didn't actually show you I had an afterthought I moved the green dot from the top left hand corner to the center of the program so that's where my program is now centered and it's one of those occasions when you might want to move the green dot generally top left hand corner now that's about a one inch gap not that it makes any difference I don't think you might just be able to see the circular pattern on there where the dampness which is still obviously residual on there is just drying off and it's still 20 milliamps So that's maximum power. We might squeeze that to 31. So somewhere along the way, we've lost six watts through the mirrors. But before we go and check that out, that's about an inch there, so that I know that the beam is well and truly defocused. So we just set this to zero again. See a little bit of steam on the surface there, look. Now that's presumably absorbing a small amount of energy. You could stretch the imagination there to maybe 30.2. Summary, we've got 37 watts at the back, we've got 31 watts at the head, and we've got about 30 watts after the lens. So the lens is not absorbing much power, but somewhere along the way we're losing 6 watts in the mirror track. Well I've cleaned this rear mirror now. We'll see what difference that makes. Now this is 10 millimeter acrylic, but I've got no more than 31.6 watts coming out of that nozzle there. 65% power, so full power, 2 millimeters a second. Now what I want you to watch is as the beam comes across this front area here, you'll see the bottom of the beam trailing behind the top of the beam. But that was when I had about 30 watts. Now I've got substantially more at 31 watts. There we go. Can you see the uh, can you see the way that the beam is trailing across the bottom there? Now it might be slow, but that's pretty impressive for 30 watts. That has answered another question as well. I thought I'd fixed my squareness problem with the head, but hang on, I haven't fixed my squareness problem with the head because you can clearly see these lovely raked lines here, and you can see the edges are running with those raked lines. So despite the fact that my 50 watt machine turns out to be 31.6 watts of usable power down here, it's still pretty impressive. I feel cheated, but I'm not upset. Now incidentally, I did a little teeny weeny bit of research on Macken instruments, and uh, <coughs> it would appear that Mr. Macken is a very interesting man. I will provide a reference in the text below to a patent application that he made. The technicalities of the patent application are not particularly worrying to you, but if you read the introduction and the prior art, there's quite a lot of good information in there about how CO2 sealed laces work. And for those of you that are interested, it might be worth a follow-up.